I just wanted to go through the basic components of the PhD program and uh, then talk about the application process and um, and after that to answer questions that any of you might have. Um, and I encourage questions, often a question that might seem simple is in fact on everybody's mind and something that I have forgotten to um, uh, to convey. And, and first, you know, I, and I've been in email exchange with some of you first just to, to underscore that the, the PhD program in architecture is a program that is focused on architectural history and theory. Uh, we present ourselves as um, operating you know, within the scope of histories of modernity, so from the 18th century to the present. Uh, so anyone that might want to be working on, on medieval or Renaissance or pre-18th century work should really be thinking about an art history program. That's not something that we, we tend to support. Um, the program, uh, as most programs in North America are, uh, has a couple of years of coursework, and I'll detail that in a second. Um, and it's only really after the coursework is completed and the requirements are completed and students undertake a, a, a generals or qualifying exam, which I'll explain, that, that people turn to work on the dissertation proper. Um, and I just mentioned that because I know in, in Europe and some other parts of the world that um, people are applying directly into a program to work with an individual uh, and begin their dissertation. And that's not, not how it tends to work um, uh, at Columbia and actually most North American programs. And, and this is important for the application process because it means you don't need to find an advisor in advance, um, which is, uh, again, very distinct from, from many other programs. Um, we, you know, tend to to understand that people are applying with a, a general sense of their field of interest and their anticipated contribution to the field of architecture, but that that field of interest often changes or is refined in all sorts of significant ways in the first two or three years of, of being in a, in a PhD program. Um, and, and I'll come back to this, but it means the application statement uh, is a little bit different to something like a dissertation proposal, uh, which is what it would have to be if you're going straight into a dissertation writing phase. Um, so I just uh, I'll just talk through the mechanics of the program. I mentioned two years of coursework, um, uh, and, and this is a mixture of more methodologically oriented courses and courses fulfilling um, different actually historical areas and geographical areas of knowledge, both in architectural history and um, in a sort of interdisciplinary framework. And I'll go through the sort of technicalities just to um, uh, begin to explain this. We, we run um, uh, what we call the PhD colloquium each fall for the first and second years, which means that you would be in, um, uh, in dialogue with colleagues from the year above in your first year and below in your second year. Uh, and in the spring semester, we offer either one or two PhD seminars um, uh, and these are these are courses which are uh, exclusive to doctoral students in in the program. The rest of the coursework that students undertake, largely seminars, um, uh, are uh, uh, broken up into a series of what we call distribution requirements. Uh, and those distribution requirements are um, are are structured or organized by historical period. So you're required to take one course that uh, addresses a period before 1750, yeah, before the mid 18th century, two 18th and 19th century classes. Uh, and then there's a then there's a requirement that you take a class that's um, uh, explicitly not in architectural history or art history. And, you know, this is um, in an era of increasingly interdisciplinary scholarship. This is a little bit of an archaism. People do that without, you know, even thinking, take classes in whether it be in anthropology or in area studies discipline or in political theory. Um, and, but these are, these are requirements that you need to fulfill. Um, and the rest of the classes are, are uh, electives and elective classes can of course be used to, to fill out your, um, your knowledge of a, of a field or subfield within architectural history, or they could be used to strengthen interdisciplinary frameworks. And, um, and and I'll um, come back to that later, but just to while I remember to say um, one way that 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 
maybe um, relates to the application process is that if there is somebody elsewhere in the university, whether it's in African American and African diaspora studies or in East Asian languages and literatures or you know anywhere else that that you can recognize to be an important resource for for your own research where you to be admitted, then you know that's an important thing to maybe mention in your application statement. It shows that you know you've recognized that there are resources at the university beyond the PhD program in architecture that can help uh, frame the most sort of robust um, uh, coursework opportunities for you. So yes, yeah, so two years of coursework, students tend to take, you have to take 13 classes across those two years. And so basically it's something like three classes a semester. Not all of those have to be taken for what we call a letter grade, which means you write a research paper. Some of them can be taken for what we call an R credit, which is like an auditing grade. And so effectively, you'd be writing two research papers a semester, you know, developing a field of expertise, but also um, uh, using that coursework to, to encounter things you might never have studied. And, um, and this is where often students you know, might come in thinking they're going to work on the 1920s and end up working on the 1850s, or come in thinking they're going to work in the Amer North American context, and end up working in a very different geographical area. And that, you know, there's many other versions of, um, uh, of, of those sort of transformations in people's fields of interest. Um, so two years of coursework that the third year um, is, is um, dedicated to the qualifying exams and the, and the formulation of a dissertation prospectus. And, and it's really at this point that that students begin to secure the person that will become their dissertation advisor uh, and the other members of, a, of their committee. The, the exams at Columbia take the form of developing two um, bibliographies, a major and a minor field of study, which you undertake um, with, with faculty, largely faculty from within the PhD committee, although there is the scope to, to have one of those members um, from an outside department, should it be critical to your field of interest? Um, and and there, you know, it's really an opportunity to to undertake an extensive period of of, of reading, um, uh, reading to become a sort of expert in the field that you're uh, through which you're going to frame the dissertation topic. Uh, and so, you know, currently people distribute those bibliographies in January for a February exam. And, and the nature of the exam, very simple, you know, students send the bibliographies to the faculty who are working on their committee. The faculty have a week to write questions. Student has two weeks to respond in a short essay. And then we meet and convene and talk through the responses and the bibliographies. And we also read uh, three, three papers that the student has written during their, their coursework period. So it's really an occasion to convene talk about where the person is at, what their interests are, are speaking to, and um, and to, to have a sort of more informal discussion um, about the dissertation research. And then there's a separate meeting um, to defend the dissertation prospectus that happens at the end of the third year. Uh, so, so this is the sort of framework. And after that, students are, are, um, are involved in the dissertation research and writing. Um, the other parts, you know, we require uh, two uh, foreign languages um, by the time you get your MPhil, which means in your third year, um, and, and they are proficiency level um, language requirements. They're not fluency in terms of spoken language. Of course, we encourage extensive language acquisition. It's not actually mandatory, but you might need it, depending on the work that you're trying to do. Um, uh, Columbia offers most of those classes. If you're needing to acquire a language that that we don't um, we don't support, then we find ways of making sure you get access to that somewhere else. Um, so uh, the other thing is we have a teaching requirement, which we standardized a number of years ago. And um, in the second and third year of the program, um, the PhD students are teaching fellows um, in, in the core history theory sequence of the Masters of Architecture program. Uh, and the way that works is that that um, the incoming MR, the first year Masters of Architecture students are divided into three groups, uh, each of which have uh, a professor 
and two teaching fellows, like two doctoral teaching fellows uh, affiliated with them. And uh, the teaching fellows are, of course, part of the larger collective conversation each week. And then they also run individual sections with half of that class. So let's say there's 30 people in the larger sort of um, sort of lecture seminar format, then the teaching fellows would have 15 people in their own section, which would meet separately for an hour and and really develop the students reading and 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 writing. Uh, and so so this is something that um, this teacher training is how Columbia frames it is considered a very important part of uh, of PhD training. Um, this is the only required teaching. In addition to that, our students often teach uh, for additional compensation in the summer in the summer session for what's called the advanced architectural design, like a post professional design program. That's entirely optional. Um, uh, some of our students want to be out in the world doing research, archival research, or other forms of research, or taking internships in the library, uh, developing skills as archivists. Um, so that 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 teaching, you know, get paid extra. It's entirely optional. Um, uh, you know, many students do it. There's also teaching opportunities at Barnard College, which is where the undergraduate architecture degree is hosted at Columbia. Um, uh, again, for additional compensation. So these are those are sort of optional frameworks. The the core required teaching takes place um, um, in the in the core history sequence of the MARC program. Um, so so that's the sort of general framework of our requirements um, and the sort of way it would unfold um, should you be admitted. And then also just to say, and and this is also different in many other countries um uh we we admit three students a year uh, and we admit students as a entire faculty in, in other words we all vote it's not like i get to choose a student and mabel wilson gets to choose a student we don't we don't make decisions that way we make decisions collectively uh around who we think the strongest applicants might be yeah who will contribute most to the field in the future um, and, uh, again, this means that you don't need to find an advisor in advance. That's absolutely critical. Um, uh, but maybe this is not related, but we admit three people a year and we, uh, offer their, them, um, uh, equivalent, um, um, funding packages. And, and again, this is quite standard in North American schools. Uh, I mean, I know sometimes in Europe, PhD students are only admitted on the basis of faculty that have grants. We don't do that. We, we fund the program. Um, you come in, you get, um, actually it's five, you know, five, um, it's a little bit complicated right now because there's a six year of funding, but the core of the program is five years of funding, which includes the funding when you're, when you're teaching um, and that, that uh, you get tuition covered for seven years, but you get five years of a, of a honorarium, summer funding, research and travel funding, these sorts of things. It comes also with healthcare. Um, um, and anyway, I don't need to go through the package, but it's it's fully funded for five years. There's a six year of optional funding. After that, tuition is paid for the seventh year, um, but you would have to teach or find external funding. And students um, do start applying for grants once they have their dissertation prospectus defended. Uh, external grants would extend, you know, the, the fully funded part um, of the program. Other people start teaching elsewhere in their sixth or seventh year if they've not finished. The idea is that you finish the dissertation um, before the seventh year. Um, some students, because of more extended um, primary research or language acquisition, you know, might take seven years. Um, but the idea is that you finish in five or six years. Uh, let's see, what else do I need to say? So maybe. I'll turn and talk a little bit about the application process. I've alluded to, to some aspects of that. The, um, you know, the key components are the statement, um, um, the statement, uh, uh, the letters of recommendation, I'll come back to those, um, your transcripts, that's sort of easy. Um, and the, the statement, you know, it's a short state and the writing samples um, and the statement uh, as I said, it 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 it's not um, it's not a statement that takes the form of my dissertation will look at you know X Y and Z and it will have four chapters. Um, it does need to um, uh, uh, 
you know, specify the type of research that you that you imagine it will undertake. So it needs some specificity, but we don't read it as if it's a dissertation prospectus. We read it as evidence that you know how to go um, from a, a larger field of interest to a very precise historical research topic. Um, and so you should be thinking about a statement that frames your broader field of interest um, and, uh, and that, and that details the type of work that you might, you know, I mean, you can, you can put that in the framework of, or in the language of, you know, I intend to, to look at this, this, you know, there's no problem there, but, um, you know, you don't, you don't need to offer the level of specificity of five chapters or the exact names of all the protagonists or institutions or sites that, that might be worked on, but you should nevertheless go from a sort of larger framing of how you situate yourself in a field, what your contribution will be to the field of architectural history, uh, what background you have in this, into uh, a, a statement of the type of research that you plan to undertake, because that will be another way of describing what type of voice you intend to have as a scholar. Um, and um, the writing samples are um, in a sort of funny way to many people, a little bit separate. We really read them as writing samples. We evaluate them to understand um, how somebody approaches uh, uh, translating research into, into arguments, into narratives. So you should be thinking about those documents, not as demonstrating that you've already done extensive work in the in the intended plan of research, um, but as evidence that you you are you know a solid scholar that you know how to write um, uh, a research essay, and yes, yeah, so so this is really what we read them for. How does this person write? Do they make a compelling argument? Do they know how to mobilize primary source documents? Uh, yep, this is how we read those parts of the application. There's no problem if they also um, um, if they also have a detailed account of um, um, uh, of material related to your field of interest. That's entirely fine, but we don't necessarily, we don't read them as evidence that you've already done work in the area that you're proposing to, to work in. Yeah, so they're, they're two slightly different channels. Um, the resume is also another, another mode of describing yourself and your achievements as are the, the, the transcripts. You know, they give us an indication of what background you have in architectural history. And I should say, people come from many different backgrounds. Some people come directly from uh, a professional master's degree. Others come from a more humanities-oriented um, um, uh, uh, master's degree. Other people come from from other fields, but have developed a significant enough uh, interest and focus on architecture and the built environment to, to be able to successfully transition into uh, becoming a historian of architecture. What do I mean? You know, we've had people coming from uh, actually from Middle Eastern studies or from visual studies or from art history and or from ethnomusicology. You know, so people have come from other fields, but have developed um, you know, a robust way of working in 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 our field uh, to be able to apply. I'd say the majority of people uh, come from a background in architecture, um, but not everybody does. And uh, we do require, you've probably all seen this, um, we don't take students directly from undergraduate degrees. Uh, you're required to have a master's degree to be admitted to the program. Uh, this is because all of our students come with what we call advanced standing, you know, and, and this means you come in with an MA, uh, you know, this is a technicality, you probably don't need to know, but anyway, you have to have a master's degree um, before you start the program. So you could be finishing that in the spring, that's fine, but you would need it before you began um, uh, studying with us. Um, what else can I say? Um, um, maybe actually I'll, I'm sure I've missed, Lots of things. I see. What else can I say? Oh, our students, just other maybe things that might be of interest. Our students regularly organize collective workshops um, or um, in symposia. They're actually just about to put out a call for papers for um, uh, for a conference in the spring. Uh, they run a series of inviting people they're interested in being in dialogue with um, uh, into a actually a, a, a collective conversation. There are also other other opportunities for you know, 
professional development and scholarly development outside the the core curriculum. Um, there are, uh, I, I mean, maybe around that core cur curriculum, I mentioned um, taking classes in other parts of the university. Not everybody needs to do that, um, but in addition, in addition to doing that on an individualized basis, you know, deciding who might be offering a seminar that that is important for you to um, uh, you know to gain expertise in. There are a couple of certificate programs that our students um, participate in. One is through the Center for Comparative Media, um, and this is a, a initiative. You know, we've been working on this for a number of years, um, um, and as it suggests. Comparative media, it's comparative both across media films, uh, sorry, media forums, yeah, whether, you know, cinema, video, art, architecture, um, uh, infrastructure, but also across geographies and times. And um, and that, that involves taking um, core classes or required classes in the certificate program, but otherwise many of the electives are, are technically overlapping. You know, you navigate the elective expectations, by taking classes that are offered in both programs, um, uh, and you, you know, you work with the the director of those certificate programs to make sure you fulfill their requirements. The other um, option is the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, a program started years ago, decades ago, by uh, Gayatri Spivak and um, Andreas Hoysen, um, and and that you know has similar sort of core classes, methods classes that that are uh, inter interdisciplinary and comparative in their scope, um, more across the divide of languages and the human and social sciences uh, with, with the humanities. This is more the framework for those. So you should look at those um, programs on their website if you're interested. These are not important for all students. Some students need a little bit more flexibility in terms of how they choose courses outside the school or if they choose courses outside the school. Um, but those things are offered. They make sense for some people, not for others. You tick the box when you apply if you want to be considered up front. Um, but there's also the opportunity to, um, uh, once you're admitted, to, to reach out to those certificate programs and um, and add them to your, um, uh, yeah, to your sort of course of study a little bit later. So you don't need to do that in advance. Um, I also just to underscore, you know, I know I find myself saying this many times that this is why I began here. We're a program um, founded in the humanities. Um, uh, we we teach people to become professors of history and theory. Um, we so we don't do more professionally oriented. We don't sponsor more professionally oriented research. Um, that might be something. Um, more appropriate for the planning program or for um, many like European programs or so we don't do uh, PhDs in architectural technology or yeah these these things do not fall within within um, the rubric of, of how we train people. Okay. okay okay well I look forward to reading your applications in the spring nice to see some familiar faces and and meet some unfamiliar faces um, and um, I wish you all the best.